Welcome everyone to the Ask the Expert session for building real-time enterprise analytics solutions with Azure Synapse Analytics. Uh, we're so excited to have you uh, join us here for um, some great question answer period. Um, some of you may have just come from Savine Reddy's session uh, with the same title. Uh, so uh, this is a great opportunity for you to ask questions and us to get some expert answers. Uh, so you should see some chat on the right for you to be able to uh, engage with everyone. So use that chat to ask questions. Uh, as you ask questions, uh, folks uh, who are ready to stand by and answer questions will be able to answer your questions uh, really quickly. And um, the questions will appear to all attendees once uh, your questions are approved by the moderator. Uh, you can upvote your favorite questions with a thumbs up and that makes sure that other folks can sort of agree and we can get some popular questions uh, rising to the top. Um, note that you know we'll have experts standing by to answer questions verbally. Uh, we'll have about five, five, people, uh, five people on our team to answer your questions live. Um, as determined by one of the moderators that we have on the on the team here. Uh, note that we'll also provide some resources at the very end um, so that you can learn more and, and take some next steps. Just note that uh, the session may be recorded um, and please, you know, help out with our uh, moderation. Uh, you know, please don't spam or post inappropriate comments in the chat. Uh, we also have a code of conduct, uh, pretty standard stuff, but just uh, uh, please keep that in mind. Um, and here's the code of conduct just uh, so everyone is aware. Um, and uh, and that, there's some information at the bottom there if you have any questions. Um, all right, so with no further ado, uh, we have uh, some excellent uh, chat experts from uh, our big data community uh, and experts helping out here. So thank you everyone that you see on the screen. Um, you'll see their uh, you'll see their names pop up in the in the chat as as folks respond to your questions in the chat. So um, a big thank you to to all these experts uh, attending uh, today and, and helping out in the chat. Uh, we're so uh, grateful to have you. So, and let me now introduce our experts who will be answering some of the questions live. Um, uh, my, my name is Matthew Hicks. I'm a program manager on the Synapse uh, platform team here at Microsoft. Uh, we have Savine Reddy, uh, principal program manager on the Synapse team. And uh, Kevin, Ron, and Ewan, uh, program managers on the Synapse team as well, are here to uh, help out and answer questions live as well. Uh, and we're so excited uh, and let's dive into it. So we have uh, some questions ready to go. It seems like we have some great questions flowing in. Uh, the first one we see, uh, I'll, I'll ask this question from Tony K. Uh, does Synapse Analytics workspaces use new features like the Photon Engine? Uh, can you elaborate on how you would use it in conjunction uh, with other services? And I think uh, Ewan, would you would you be able to take that one? Yep, uh, happy to. Um, so first of all, the Photon Engine is Databricks proprietary technology. And so it's not something that's available in the open source version of Spark. And the version of Spark that we use inside of Synapse is derived from the Apache trunk version. And then we layer on a whole bunch of Microsoft uh, technologies and capabilities on top of that. So in terms of compare and contrast, um, that's that's one difference. Um, I'm also going to kind of attack a couple of the other questions which are sitting out there. One of the big differences between Databricks and what we have with Synapse is with Synapse, we bring together a bunch of what we believe are best in breed technologies to solve what is an analytics problem. So what's the best tool we have in Azure for integrating data? Well, it's Data Factory. And so we use the core of Data Factory within Synapse as part of orchestration integration. Um, what's the right way to answer SQL queries? Well, it may not be Spark. It may be an on-demand SQL type engine or serverless SQL engine. And what's the right way to access modeled SQL data? Well, that's going to be through a dedicated SQL pool. And so from our perspective, we are providing multiple different technologies to solve the end-to-end -end analytics problem rather than a single uh, technology. Thank you, Ewan. All right, so uh, we have another great question. Um, it's a little bit of a long one, uh, so I'll read it out. Uh, is it or will it be possible to connect to an analysis, analysis services source, more specifically XMLA endpoint for Power BI Premium? to ingest data into Synapse. Um, let's see, uh, Sabine, who do you think would be the right person to answer that question? Oh, I think you're muted, Sabine. Sorry, uh, I think for that one, we're gonna have to follow up a bit offline. Uh, cool. We get one of our other ex experts, Josh, to talk about that. Okay, all right, thanks. Uh, so let's see, we have another question from Saren. Uh, using Synapse Analytics for end user data mart, uh, is that a possibility without running into query concurrency issues? Uh, let's see, uh, Ron, would you be able to take that one? Uh, I, th I think Andrew 
um, touched on it a bit, but yeah, I mean, there, there's other things like workload management that you can use to um, set importance and, and, you know, divide up resources and, and kind of manage loading transformations that go into data marts as well as end user queries. So the, the tools are there um, for you to, to be able to do that. Uh, I, you know, I'd also recommend looking into to things like uh, materialized views, um, you know, result set caching is is not a, a resource consuming query. So where result set caching can help out, um, that can also help with your overall throughput um, for, for data mart access. All right, thank you so much, Ron. Uh, so we have a great question. Uh, how does cost work with Synapse? Um, Kevin, uh, no, would you like to take that one? Yeah, sure. So for um, cost with Synapse, this is a purely opt-in experience where you pay and you um, you are charged for the resources and components that you consume. Um, so there's a, a public kind of uh, facing doc that we do have on our pricing page that does go into um, you know, how we uh, charge for Spark, how are the SQL resources that um, you provision um, are charged as well. So it's a completely opt-in experience. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so I have a good question, I think, for you. And um, when should folks uh, think about using Synapse versus HD Insight versus other services for uh, Spark, uh, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I think each of the, the three primary Spark experiences that we provide in Azure has unique and differentiated capabilities. So if I take a look at something like Spark running in HDI, that's really all about control and integration with other open source platforms, because HDI is not just about Spark, it's about Kafka, um, it's about Hive, it's about a bunch of different technologies, most of which we don't have inside of Synapse. Also, if you want to be able to SSH into the head nodes and your Spark cluster and control configuration and things like that, then HDI is going to be your answer. Uh, I think the nice thing about Synapse, as I said in my earlier answer, is that in Synapse, we have these different technologies, but they're all designed to work together. So we have a single user experience. We have a single auth model. We have a single monitoring model across all of those. And realistically, any big complex analytical app is going to involve some Spark stuff, some data integration stuff, some SQL in terms of serving the models up and serving them up to some sort of technology like Power BI. So I think they're just, they're different ways of solving the problem and you get to choose. And the nice answer is that in Azure, we have all the options available. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a good question for Savine. Uh, are notebooks in Synapse Studio accessible or downloadable so we can use these outside of Synapse Studio? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, our notebooks are importable and exportable as IPUI and B files. So there's nothing, there's nothing special about them, uh, especially when you're just writing normal Spark code or by Spark or Scala or whatever. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is that uh, we do have, of course, as, as I mentioned or showed on my slide, uh, there's a MS Spark Utils library, right? So that's of course unique to uh, uh, Synapse. So that library won't be available elsewhere except through Synapse. That's the one catch that statement. Awesome. And you and maybe there anything else you want to talk maybe with regard to libraries and notebooks that might affect the ability of people to use them and export? Um, I think you hit the main point there, Savine. You know, different uh, backends and different uh, implementations of the Jupyter engine support different libraries. Uh, there are some technologies like we don't support IPy widgets if you're a Jupyter person, um, and I think MS Spark Utils is one of the other differences. Also, Magic support is another place where there's differences between different implementations of Jupyter. But I would argue that 90, 95% of your code should just easily migrate uh, along with the notebook, and then there's some tweaks which are environment specific. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So we have another question, uh, I think, for Savi on this one as well. Uh, when will DevOps or uh, GitHub integration be available? Can, can you share some more details on that? Yeah, so this is uh, probably our number one question. Um, so the, the, the straight truth is this. Uh, we are working on it actively at this moment. It will be part of our GA. And, you know, we don't have a GA date yet. We are working on it. it you won't be waiting too much longer. It will be part of that that GA release. Excellent, thank you. All right, uh, so let's let's go on to some of our uh, some of our other questions. We have one regarding, um, let's see. Do you have information about uh, 
when uh, SQL serverless over SQL pool data will be available. Uh, Savine, who do you think would be the right person to answer that question? I think Ron is probably the best one for this one. Ron, could you take that one? So the, uh, when will serverless over SQL pool data be available? Oh, and you're muted. There we go. Sorry. Um, that's something that we're certainly working towards. Um, and yeah, and that's a future sort of thing that we're we definitely see um, you know user scenarios for to be able to have the the serverless pay per terabyte scanned and and the the provision pay per DWU um, accessing seamlessly over the same data sets. So for sure, something that we're looking into. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, so one of the one of the common questions that we definitely get, and one that's good to, to cover, I know Sabine covered it in your session, but if you haven't uh, seen the session yet and you're attending a different uh, instance of it, there's a question about uh, Synapse Analytics, the preview features. Uh, when when do we expect uh, those capabilities uh, to become available, and uh, when can be, uh, can people try those features out today? I just make sure I understand the question. Uh, could you can you say it again? The preview Absolutely. features when they can. So we have uh, you know Azure Synapse Analytics preview features, including the workspaces. Uh, can users try those out today? And when do you think those will be available uh, in a generally available fashion? Okay, ab absolutely. So everything, you know, I had a large slide that I mentioned at my my session, my breakout session. Everything I showed you will be available, it is either available now or shortly available by the end of this week. So I think most of them are actually available this very second. So you can try everything out now in preview. Just in general, you can try Azure Synapse workspaces. It's been available now in public preview for a while. So when the switch turns to generally available, which is again, you know, not too much longer from now, uh, though we don't have an exact date. At that moment, every feature I mentioned uh, in that list anyway will become sort of automatically a generally available feature that we support in production. I, I hope that answers the question. I think so. Thank you. Uh, and so we have uh, some other questions coming in that are related to uh, the topic of migration. So uh, for, for folks who are using ADF today, uh, or SQL DW, and there might be a, a separate person answer to the SQL DW related questions. Uh, if you're using SQL DW newly branded uh, uh, Synapse Analytics, GA functionality of Synapse Analytics, uh, is there any sort of migration planned or is there any, how, how do those uh, users get, uh, uh, take advantage of these preview workspace features? Right, so let's let's start with the first, you know, you said the word migration and migration sort of, it has an implication of maybe changing things or moving things so when we, gener when we make Synapse workspaces generally available and you're already using what you used to call a DW, there is no per se migration. What will happen is if you have an existing, uh, what we now call, of course, a dedicated SQL pool, formerly a DW, we will give you the ability to use the Synapse, the new preview, uh, sorry, the new workspace feature set. You can essentially add a workspace on top of your, your SQL pool, your formerly DW, right? You don't have to even do that. You can continue working after our GA date completely as normal. We'd encourage you to, you know, add the workspace feature to it because it just enables so many more scenarios. Okay, so that's so there's no migration. It just you can now use a new feature, right? It'll be available for you, and that's and that features everything in the workspaces: Spark, Serverless SQL, pipelines, you know, a bunch of things. Synapse Link. The second question is about, I believe, ADF. And some of you already have an existing ADF instance, right? And you have pipelines that are calling SQL pools either to do data movement or orchestration. So the short answer is, you know, we're not upgrading ADF uh, factories into Synapse. Uh, our strategy there is, and this will be post our generally available date, is if you've already developed pipelines in a data factory, and of course, you you want to simplify everything by moving everything into a, a Synapse workspace. We're working on a plan to allow you to uh, import those pipelines from an existing data factory into a Synapse workspace, right? So that's our plan for addressing the ability to like sort of put everything back together into a single workspace. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, we have a great next question for uh, Ewan. Uh, will the library management in Synapse um, uh, change at all? And then will I have uh, the ability to use Maven Central, for example, uh, to manage my libraries uh, with Synapse, uh, Apache Spark in Synapse? Yeah, another great question. 
We're actually rolling out some changes this week um, in terms of library management. You're now be able to use jar files for library management in addition to your previously able to use PyPI files. Um, the ability to just specify Maven coordinates is on the list of things to do. Library management is going to be an evolving capability for quite a while. It's quite a big and complex space. And so we're going to keep adding and adding and adding based on user requests over time. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, so we also have a question. Uh, Sabine, in your um, in your session, you talked about Power Query. Uh, could you talk about some of the cases where you would use uh, data flow versus Power Query? Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, uh, where there where these are exposed in Synapse are in our pipelines, and there are two kinds of activities: there are data flow activities, and there's Power Query activities. And Power Query activities. Uh, were formerly called uh, data wrangling flows or something that that word data wrangling in them, right? So, um, and, I, and there are different approaches to answering this question. The, how I would say is this, by and large, they can be used to do the same thing. They take some input data and can transform it in all sorts of ways, right? Um, and there's some differences in the feature set, et cetera. But primarily, if you want to think about your transformation of data in this kind of graph based way it's kind of visually oriented and that's the way you think about it then the uh, the data flow is a great way of doing it right now, on the other hand if the way you think about transforming your data it, you're used to think about it as a set of transformations on rows that you visually see in a tabular manner then the power query experience is a much more optimized for you you'll you'll understand it better that way so uh, that's one way i would say like how do you sort of mentally pick between the two Again, there are other differences, but that, that to me is the primary way you think about it. Awesome, thank you, Sabine. All right, uh, we have another question. I think this one will be uh, for Kevin, uh, sort of a SQL question. Uh, when to choose creating an internal table versus an external table? What are some best practices to follow? Yeah, so thanks, to thanks, Matthew. Um, so the difference is, so the question was, um, Yes, yeah, so when do you choose between internal or I guess managed tables versus external tables? Right. Um, I think a very, very common scenario is for external tables. Um, if you don't want to, um, before you actually import your data into um, a SQL database as a managed table, um, there's a very common scenario for data lake kind of exploration scenarios where you want to immediately issue ad hoc queries over the lake and a very common interface that um, users do today is to do that over using external tables. And once you kind of um, discover and kind of understand your data, um, you understand and you want to transform it or join with kind of high value data within your SQL database, you then do a, a load using kind of um, our interfaces like the copy statement into a um, SQL database as a managed table, and then you can do further um, or transformations or um, start kind of deriving insights on top of that manage table. Thank you so much. Um, so we have two questions from from Gary. Uh, I'll, I'll split them out to two different people. One is uh, for Ewan uh, regarding, regarding Spark libraries. Are there any storage limits for Spark libraries that uh, we should be aware of? In terms of how many you can have? How many, or I guess uh, in terms of this, the size of the libraries that you can use with uh, Apache Spark and Synapse? Um, no, but do bear in mind that libraries um, are installed at runtime. So we provide a couple hundred libraries in the base image that we use for Spark. And then in the libraries you specify with a requirements.txt are installed as part of cluster boot time. And so if you, for example, have a dependency on MKL, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to download and install. That means the fastest that your cluster will start will be 20 to 30 minutes every single time. Um, we do add more libraries to the base image, but there's some that we can't um, for a variety of reasons. There is a limit on the maximum size of requirements or text file you can have in terms of the number of entries, and it's around 500 rows if I remember correctly. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so. We actually uh, have an interesting uh, other question from uh, from someone related to cost. So if folks are concerned about sort of uh, the, the cost of Synapse Analytics, 
um, how should they understand, you know, uh, wh whether, you know, it's it's really meant for huge amounts of data or, you know, it can be used with small amounts of data. I think, Sabine, this is, might be another question that you uh, talk about within your session, but if any, if any folks on this call haven't been on the session yet, I think that's an interesting question. So what sizes of data uh, and how does that impact cost? Uh, should, should people be familiar with when they use Synapse? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, you know, uh, all performance and scale questions are answered with it depends. But in terms of, you know, what Synapse can address, uh, you know, when we talk about the product, we do use the word limitless and we do talk about that in both dimensions or sort of both ends of the domain, same dimension. Number one, it's for any, you know, there are customers who have not really that much data, like in the in the low terabyte, even less actually terabytes. Uh, certainly Synapse sc scales to those smaller cases. Abs absolutely. Synapse uh, is also scaling to the world of petabytes. Now, some of you may have seen uh, a petabyte scale demo with serverless SQL, I think last year at uh, Ignite in 2019. Um, on top of that, you know, we, of course, by integrating Apache Spark, we're gaining tremendous scale, right? And can do larger low workloads. I would say uh, anything up from, you know, their smallest data sets into the petabytes scale is where, where synapses are, that's a sweet spot. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Um, I think I have a question for uh, for either Kevin or Ron. I'll let uh, either of you take this. Uh, are you planning to include an execute SQL task in Synapse pipelines? Um, this might be related to the stored procedure support that we might already have, but um, maybe you can expand upon that. Uh, why don't we go with uh, Ron or, or, or Kevin, whichever you want to take that one. I, I guess I would assume that's more related to Azure Data Factory. Um, I don't okay. know, Kevin, do you have any thoughts yep. on that? Yeah, so um, with Synapse Pipelines, uh, it has very similar capabilities as Azure Data Factory, um, where um, you can actually create multiple you know, activities within a particular pipeline. In this case, in, for specifically SQL, there is the um, store procedure activity, which you know you can define. You can define and create a store procedure within your SQL database, um, which has a you know transformation logic, and that can be executed from these pipelines. Or you can create um, you know another activity um, called the copy activity within the pipelines, um, which internally does use you know um, SQL statements like um, the copy statement or um, external tables to load data. Um, so these are kind of the um, integrations between Synapse pipelines and kind of the um, and SQL pools within Synapse workspaces. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, all right. Uh, another question uh, for, let's see, Sabine. Um, is it possible to just query data that's already in my lake rather than storing it into a data warehouse first? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's, uh, you know, that's one of the key things we're enabling with Synapse and probably the way you most easily experience that, which is serverless SQL. You know, our very first sample with the product is doing a select star open row set from a file in blob storage. And, no, and there's no schema specified. And that file could be a CSV file, could be a parquet file. And of course, uh, I mentioned blob storage there, but also in data lake storage uh, in Gen 2 here I'm talking about. So yeah, it is absolutely built to do that without creating views or using polybase, just directly query the data. All right. Awesome. Um, so I think we might have time for one more question before we dive into the sort of the, the next steps and the action items. Um, so, yep. Yeah. I think there's a there's a, a question for you and around uh, mm -hmm. Databricks and Synapse and how the technologies relate. Let's, so let's take that you, one, yeah. you could yeah. maybe clarify like how these two pieces of what's in Azure relate to each other. Do they use each other, et cetera? Yeah. So. I talked a little bit earlier about how the um, the different engines provide different capabilities, and actually, you should search through the answers that Andrew Brust has provided. He gave a, a, a very kind of pointed answer on what's the difference between the different tags between HDI, Synapse, and Databricks. But let's be very clear today. So Synapse does not use Databricks today. It is not part, Databricks is not part of the Synapse offering, but because of common file formats, uh, for example, Delta Lake is supported by both Parquet, CSV, these sorts of technologies. It means you can use the two in conjunction with each other. You just won't get the integrated experience that Synapse provides with Databricks. Um, and so if you're already on Databricks today, 
probably best to continue using Databricks, but you can also bring Synapse into the equation as well. If you're making a choice about which version of Spark you want to use today, I would look at other factors like, do you need a SQL uh, serverless answer? Do you need a SQL uh, dedicated answer as part of your offering? If the answer to those is yes, uh, then you know, Synapse certainly comes into play at that point in time. Um, and so from that perspective, they solve, as I said earlier, they solve the same domain in terms of cloud scale unified analytics, but we've taken two different ways to do it. And the nice thing about Azure is if you want to use Azure Databricks, it's right there. You use the same ADLS Gen 2 Lake that Synapse can also use. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Ewan. Um, you know, looking at the clock, we might have time for one quick, uh, one more question uh, before we wrap up with uh, some of the action items and next steps. Um, Ewan, just going going back to you for for one last question. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the about the Apache Spark uh, uh, offering that's available within Synapse and and what kind of uh, capabilities come with Apache Spark and Synapse? That's great. Thanks, Matthew. Um, yeah, so we take the core Apache Spark trunk, so the, the completely open source version, and we do it. We add a bunch of work to it, some of which Savine actually showed on the ML side during his session, the Hummingbird technology, which is also open source. Uh, we also add in things like hyperspace indexes, which is an open source project. Uh, and we add in uh, uh, .NET for Spark, which is also open source. So we add in uh, a bunch of these technologies, including some of Microsoft proprietary uh, IP, particularly in the perf space. We work with Microsoft Research uh, from that perspective. Then we add features. A lot of those features are to do with being part of Synapse. So we think about the most important feature in Spark uh, in terms of Synapse to be integration with Synapse. Um, and so that means that things like single sign-on must work, the security model must work, VNets must work, the monitoring experience must work. So that's our most important feature. And we'll continue over time to build on what we get from um, the Apache Foundation. And in the case of Delta Lake, that actually comes from the Linux Foundation. And so there are open source projects, uh, multiple ones out there that we're able to integrate into the, excuse me, into the stack. All right, thank you so much, Ewan. Um, just a big thank you to all our experts for joining today. And also, most importantly, thank you, uh, everyone in the audience, for asking some great questions. Um, it was a great opportunity for folks to ask questions and us to um, uh, ha have us answer your questions live. Um, what I'd like to do is is show you some of our uh, some resources and call to action. Um, I believe uh, a recording of this will be available for everyone, as well as uh, these links in the slides. So uh, take a look at this. Uh, there are some great next steps for trying out the latest Azure Synapse uh, features um, with a free uh, trial account from Azure. Um, you can also try out our analytics in a day for a, a hands-on workshop. There's also a step-by-step -step tutorial that we offer for Synapse Analytics. And you can also download a Getting Started Toolkit. And all these resources are available for you now. So we encourage everyone to try that out. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for uh, attending this and participating. Um, and if you haven't seen Savine's session yet, um, I encourage you to, to uh, there's two more time slots. And uh, Savine, is there anything you'd like to say to close it out? Yeah, I would say, first of all, thank you for your time and patience. You know, Synapse is a big step forward for us. And it's you can't imagine the years we've spent getting to this point and I can assure you that where we're going is just an amazing place an absolutely amazing place so uh, I'm glad you're on this journey with us so thank you everybody thanks